first talk is going to be in our Miri's talk uh, looking at Hyracarian wood frogs. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear this talk and learn a little bit more about this species. Please go ahead. I want to um, talk about uh, my article uh, tracking climate change in, uh, in the spatial distribution pattern and the phylogeographic structure at Hyracarian wood frog when a pseudomatina. Um, this is my article. Yeah, uh, I had a wonderful time when I wait, when I uh, write it with my professor and my colleague. First of all, I wanted to talk about introduction and after that materials and methods and result and um, discussion. Uh, as you know, uh, climate change through time have important effects on the evolutionary history and spatial distribution of the species. Um, there are many evidence that the whole Arctic creatures were significantly influenced by the Pleistocene weather condition at the time scale 100,000 years ago. Amphibian are ideal model organism for the reconstruction of the colonization history of Biomes. A study showed that among all Anura, Rena species have the greatest impact on the temperature and the latitude factors. Iranian long legged wood frog, uh, Rena pseudodalmatina, is one of the endemic species of Iran and um, lives in the north of my country in the Hyrcanian forest and uh, that acted as a glacial refugium for a broad range of taxa. Uh, as you see, as you can see, this is just the, this uh, a distribution of this species. And uh, the main aims of this study are to investigate uh, the evolutionary history and demographic history of Rena pseudodalmatina based on two mitochondrial DNA fragments, Cytochrome B and 16S, to assess the impact of the past and more recent climate fluctuations on the spatial distribution pattern uh, of the species using SPM. Uh, and uh, for this purpose, uh, 20 samples of Rena pseudodalmatina and five specimens of Rena macrocanonis were collected across the distribution range in Hurkanian forest. Um, DNA was extracted and be analyzed to empty DNA um, with a wide variety of uh, software. Uh, and also we use um, a species distribution modeling approach uh, to investigate the potative classical refugia for this species. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, we found that Hyrcanian or Iranian lineage, including Rene Sododalmatina, uh, diverged from the Anatolian lineage, including Rana Macrocanemis, Rana Macrocanemis Tavasensis, and Rana Holtzi during the late Miocene. And the Hyrcanian lineage diverged from other species of the genus Rana in the Europe during the Middle Miocene. And also, we found that Rana Sodalmatina display a phylogeographic pattern with two regional clades across its distribution range in the east and the west of Hyrcanian forest. Uh, diverg uh, divergence within uh, two regional clades of the Rene Sodalmatina date to the early Pleistocene, and um, which may be indicating this species affected by climate, climate fluctuations. Um, the Estiva and BBM analysis indicated that the divergence within the population of Rene Sododalmatina may have occurred during the Vicarian's events like increase of Caspian seawater level during the Pleistocene, and also the Eastern haplotype diverged from the Western clade. Uh, and um, uh, and also uh, with uh, combining a species distribution modeling um, 
and phylogeographic study. We found that the genetic structure of Brenna uh, sort of Dalmatina has been affected by the Pleistocene climate fluctuations and diverge into two Western and Eastern uh, regional clades uh, with the recent expansion of population. And also showed that recurrence and dispersal events uh, may have reinforced its uh, allopatric um, divergence of this species. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we actually have quite a bit of time for questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or uh, you can just raise your hand and uh, we'll go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really interesting. So just can I start off with a couple questions just because we have a few minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this habitat, it, it's along the, the sea there. Um, are you, I think you said it, but I, I, I missed it. Did you say that this was probably a vicarious event from marine like separating the uh, marine inflow, separating these two parts of this remnant forest? Uh, separated into two parts, Western Calais and Eastern Calais. Yeah. yeah. What was yeah. the driver for that, that you, you're, you're suggesting? Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't get it exactly. Oh. Pardon me. Um, are, are, are you saying that, that it was a, a reduction of the forest presence and that separated that western and eastern clade? Or was it the ocean that split them up and caused that bicarians? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I say that uh, may have occurred during the recurrence events, uh, like the increase of uh, Caspian Sea water level. And uh, because of that, uh, 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 these species are separated to the Western clades and Eastern clades. Okay, very cool. It's not too often. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know of a couple other examples of, of marine based vicarians and frogs, but this is a that's a really interesting one. Thank you. Thank uh, you for sharing your work. Uh, yeah, welcome. We move on to Alexander Douglas and uh, looking at American wood frogs, North American wood frogs and skin transcriptome. All right. So yeah, my name is Alexander Douglas. I'm from the Katzenbach lab at the University of Waterloo. And I'll be presenting my research where I assembled a skin transcriptome for Anasobatica, and I predicted some novel antimicrobial peptides. So as I'm sure most, if not all of you are familiar, there are a number of emerging pathogens that are currently threatening amphibians, um, and in particular frog species. Uh, two of the key pathogens that we often deal with are Petrachochytrium dendropatitis, or BD, and ranaviruses such as frog virus 3. One of the things that unites these two pathogens, despite their many differences, are that they either infect or pass through epithelia in order to initiate systemic infections. So as these pathogens are often present in the aquatic environment and are trying to enter the amphibians to initiate infection, they need to pass through the skin. And as with most organisms, the skin of frogs is the primary point of contact with the external environment and one of their main barriers to infection. So in order to prevent infection, uh, they incorporate a number of oh, uh, physical, chemical, and immunological defenses. And one of these are antimicrobial peptides. So amphibians are known to produce a really diverse array of antimicrobial peptides. Um, they are actually known to produce a much higher number of antimicrobial peptides than mammals, uh, despite mammals often being more heavily studied. And while these AMPs have been shown to have general antimicrobial activity, uh, particularly against human pathogens and also against common model organisms, uh, the function in amphibians is often not very well understood. So we believe that they may be helpful in defense against these emerging pathogens, but that data is often unclear. 
So the species that I study is the North American wood frog. Uh, these are an ecologically important species with a very wide range. Uh, they're extremely widespread throughout Canada and Alaska, including the far north, where they're often the only amphibian species present. Another important note is that the species is known to be susceptible to both BD and frog virus 3, so they make an interesting model for some disease studies. Now, Rana sabbatica is only known to produce two antimicrobial peptides at present, and these are Brevenin 1SY, which has been observed in both adults and metamorphs, and Temporin 1SY, which has only been observed in metamorphs. This is a bit unusual, as most other members of the RANA genus are known to produce a much larger number of AMPs, or at least of those that have been studied. Um, so it seems to indicate that RANA sabbatica may be able to express more than have been observed. And this is the overall hypothesis of my research, is that RANA sabbatica likely does produce additional AMPs on top of the two recognized. Um, but the challenges in testing this and finding these additional AMPs are that previous studies on the species used biochemical analysis, and this showed only the two that have currently been observed. It didn't seem to indicate any additional peptides. And additionally, there's currently no published genome or transcriptome for Rana sabbatica, making it difficult to do genome mining and try and predict novel antimicrobial peptides from the species. So to begin my research, I set out to develop a de novo transcriptome for Rana sylvatica using skin transcripts, which were taken uh, by a previous research project. I assembled them in a program known as Trinity. So this was de novo. I wasn't using any sort of alignment to an existing genome or transcriptome. I then checked the assembly for quality, ensuring that the mRNA sequences that we were producing uh, did seem to reflect real transcripts, and I also looked for homology to existing uh, antimicrobial peptide sequences in the antimicrobial peptide database. So the results of this were really quite exciting. We were able to find what appear to be intact precursor peptides for Brevenin-1-SY and Temporin-1-SY, the two known AMPs. And in addition to this, we found four novel antimicrobial peptide precursor sequences that were present, uh, don't appear to line up with either of the two known AMPs, but do have a very high homology to some antimicrobial peptides from other RANA species. Additional note, just to give a little bit of relevance to these antimicrobial peptides, uh, we have done some experiments with Brevenin-1-SY, one of the known AMPs, and we've shown that at high concentrations, at least, it seems to be able to inhibit frog virus 3 replication. Um, so we're hoping that some of these novel AMPs might have similar activities against key pathogens. So just to sum up the research so far, uh, the assembled transcriptome seems to be of good quality and is a valuable research for AMP prediction and potentially future research of our sabbatica skin. The or transcript data suggests that Rana sabbatica can express a broader repertoire of AMPs, at least transcriptionally. Um, it indicated that Temporin 1SY transcripts are present in adults, which was previously not recognized. And it's very possible that there may be additional antimicrobial peptides, which we weren't able to observe as they're only expressed or transcribed uh, in response to pathogen challenges or other factors. So my future PhD research is going to focus on both confirming the expression of these AMPs in live individuals and observing their activity against pathogens. I'd like to acknowledge contributions from the Katzenbach Lab, who've been very supportive to my research, all the members there, as well as funding from NSERC and support from the University of Waterloo. And thank you very much for watching my presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Everyone's very, uh, very on time today. Well done. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have, a, we have a couple of minutes for questions. We can do more at the end as well, but. Julie. Hi, sorry, my camera's off right now, but I just was wondering if um, where the frogs were collected. I, I might've missed that in the talk. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I hadn't included that just for the sake of time, but the frogs were collected um, I believe it was in Tennessee from Vanderbilt University. 
I could double check on that, but it was an American population. Okay, very cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Excellent. Um, so can I just ask one quick one? You said that, yeah, that wood frogs um, appear to have a lower diversity of um, antiviral or anti-pathogen uh, uh, skin uh, uh, peptides. Why, why would that be, it, considering that their lifestyle and, the, and they're often quite numerous in an area, what, why would they have so few? Yeah, so, I mean, that's part of our, our hypothesis. We suspect that they do have a larger diversity and probably have an arsenal comparable to other rand species. Um, but it could just be that they're expressing them more selectively than we've observed in other species, like bullfrogs or leopard frogs. Um, ultimately, a lot of these traditional methods of finding AMPs just involve collecting skin secretions and then testing for them using mass spectrometry, other um, spectrometry techniques to see if they match up with uh, known existing antimicrobial peptides. So it could just be that these peptides for Manisobatica, you know, either weren't being expressed at the time of the experimentation, um, they didn't line up well enough with an expected AMP to present a match on mass spectrum data. Um, there's really a few different reasons that they could have gone undetected up until now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Fred has a question in the chat, but I think we're going to move on to the next one and, and uh, we can answer that question at the end. All right. Awesome. Thank you yes. very much. Uh, so, Hollis Dawn, um, you are up. All right. So, my name's Hollis Dane. Uh, I'm at the University of Toronto and I study bullfrogs. And I've got some very fresh results on the morphology part of my study. But I'll jump in with a video from the summer of 2019, when the world was very different. And I was out in the field, and I heard a very familiar, lovely sound, very nostalgic. A bullfrog chorus is something many of you have no doubt encountered in the eastern parts of North America, but this was not in North America, unfortunately. This was on the shores of Elong Lake in the far south of Yunnan province in China. And I had mixed feelings about encountering there, them there. On one hand, it was something so comforting and familiar so far from home. And on the other hand, I wasn't exactly happy to hear them courting and chorusing in this place. But bullfrog choruses are something that can be heard all over the world today, um, these introduced populations have been shown to disrupt local ecosystems in a variety of ways, notably by competing with or directly preying upon native frogs and really anything that fits in their mouth. They also tolerate and carry chytrid fungus quite well. And so a lot of people are concerned about them, especially out west in BC and the uh, western US. But you have to wonder with a distribution like this, how they got to those places uh, in the first place. But believe it or not, there is a huge demand worldwide for frog meat. And when wild harvest could not keep up, we saw the advent of large scale frog farming. And I can't just say large scale frog farming without showing some videos of these large scale frog farms and their sounds. This is generally what those farms look like, uh, obviously very different from how we encounter bullfrogs in the wild. The conditions are crowded, there's little mobility, there's sanitation concerns, and they eat a pelleted diet. And uh, so, yeah, pretty crazy situation, these farms. But what that leaves us with is in different parts of the world, we have populations of native introduced and farmed bullfrogs. I'm interested in invasive species, particularly in the rapid phenotypic changes we often see in invasive species, the ones they undergo in those new environments in the introduced range. But this system has that twist of cultivation, which presents its own domestication selection regime. And we can think about how those two things might relate to each other. 
the farms could form a sort of intermediate stage or a filter that bullfrogs need to pass through before they reach the introduced range. Or if both are founded at similar times, they could influence each other through gene flow. And both of these are particularly interesting if selection is happening in one or both because the traits that make a good farmed bullfrog might necessarily make a good invasive bullfrog. So any selection in these different environments could be antagonistic or it could be complementary. I'm really stoked with this as a system. But a uh, first step in investigating this dynamic was to see, are there any patterns of phenotypic differences between native farmed and introduced bullfrogs? And for this, I focused on traits that are ecologically important to bullfrogs, specifically limb length and gape size. Limb length, uh, which is intuitively very important for locomotion and very important for dispersal ability in the wild, might not be worth maintaining in the farms. But this is inspired by limb length studies on other invasive amphibians that find a lengthening of limbs in the invasion fronts. And gape size, because this is a gape limited predator, and from other literature, it does seem that there may be a dietary shift in prey size in some of these introduced regions towards larger prey items. And as I said, in the farms, they eat very small pellets, so there would be no need to maintain something like that. So I collected bullfrogs from as many different farms and wild populations as I could reasonably do in three field seasons. Um, I spent a lot of time in China, Korea, Eastern US, Western US, and that was catching, physically catching bullfrogs in the wild, as well as traveling to farms, inspecting the farms, asking a bunch of questions and buying frogs off of them. And we also got a lot of samples from ongoing eradication programs. And all total, this was 1,205 frogs that I measured. And I took these measurements from those frogs uh, and for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the question of allometry instead of shape. Um, so we'll be looking at the size of a particular part of the body relative to body length. Um, additionally, I checked repeatability of these measurements by measuring a subset of samples at the very beginning and then again at the very end of the study to see how well they correlated. Those measurements then went through a little bit of pre-processing before modeling. Because the forelimbs are, because the limbs are intrinsically a length question, I could sum up uh, the forelimb and the hind limb measurements separately, then log transform them, then put them in modeling. For the head measurements, um, because it's not really a length question, I did a PCA on those, and then took dimension one of the PCA as a proxy for head size. And those three things then separately got fed into a mixed effect modeling framework. Um, and a mixed, in this framework, we build what we think are ecologically plausible models to explain this variation that can hopefully weed out what parts of that variation are due to these different influences and see if there's an effect for our treatment here being native farmed or introduced. And then we use model selection to see which of these best fit our data. So uh, for something like this, it spits out maybe five different models, all with similar weights. There's no clear winner. So we then feed it into a model averaging approach. And that will draw conclusions, taking these different contributions of the top models into account. Uh, in this approach, you're more interested in the parameter estimates coming out of your models than something like a p-value. And this happens to be the results for the head allometry, so that head size relative to the rest of the body size in each frog. And uh, though when we get this many models that come up as, a, as a similarly weighted, that might be a, an indication that there's not much signal. And we find for the treatment parameter, um, th this is just a plot of our parameter estimates. And as a rule of thumb, 
if the if those 95% confidence intervals overlap zero, that means they're not confidence intervals include zero difference with the native range because the native range is referenced here. So for farmed individuals in our treatment effect, we see not really a big difference between the native range and the introduced, just marginally a smaller intercept uh, compared to the native range. So overall smaller head size in the introduced range relative to the native range. Um, those sex related terms in this model also pulled out that the males have overall slightly larger heads. That's uh, irrespective of treatment. Moving on to the four limbs. These were our top models for that. I'm going to be going through this kind of quickly. And the parameter estimates from those, oh, notably from this, our top model by far has an interaction effect between treatment and body length. So that's not only a change in the intercept, but a change in the slope in this one. So on the left are intercept estimates for treatment. We see a smaller intercept in the introduced range, but a steeper slope relative to body length. So lower intercept, steeper slope in the introduced range, and the farmed here also overlap zero, so no important difference. To visualize this a little more clearly, I also then asked the model to predict four limb lengths for different uh, groups for different body sizes so we could visualize those patterns a little more. And they look pretty similar, but uh, if you look down towards the lower sizes, uh, body length is on the X, four limb length is on the Y. If you look at the smaller, maybe like the juvenile frog sizes, you'll see uh, four limb length is smaller, but by the time they reach the adult sizes, uh, four limb length is longer for the introduced range. Uh, and here is the real data for comparison with just a simple uh, linear smoothing where we see pretty much the same trends, even with that simple metric. Next with the hind limbs, a uh, similar set of models coming out of that, where we have that same interaction term. And we see no difference in the intercept this time in either of the intercepts with the native range. So overall hind limb size isn't coming out as important here, but we see a difference in the slope again, a difference in the hind limb slope relative to body length in the introduced range. The farmed ones, almost have a shallower slope, but again, that confidence interval does include zero difference, so we can't be sure. Um, and if I use the model to predict those values, again, we can get a better look at those trends. And again, you can see towards the bottom of the graph, so towards the smaller sizes, smaller hind limbs in the introduced and slightly larger in the native range. But by the time they get to those larger adult sizes, the relationship flips and we see longer hind limbs in the introduced range than in the native range. And with that separation, it does look like there could be something going on with the farmed ones, but I, I am going to need to look into that more. So overall, for the gape size, we find the intercept is smaller for the introduced relative to the native and no difference in farms versus native. So could be overall a smaller head size in the introduced range, which is both unintuitive and uh, marginally significant. So I'm gonna to wanna to tease that out a little more. But in the limb length, we see a steeper allometry for both forelimbs and hind limbs in the introduced range versus the native range. The introduced also have a smaller forelimb intercept than the native range, and the farmed ones come out as marginally significant. So thinking about how this might look on the ground, um, if you pick up an introduced bullfrog, I'm not saying where it is because we put all the introduced bullfrogs in one bucket for this question. If you pick up an introduced bullfrog and it's in the adult size class, so maybe over 100 millimeters roughly, it's more likely to have longer limbs than its native counterpart at the same size. But in the smaller sizes, the opposite is true, and we're seeing shorter limbs. And we know limb length, especially the hind limb length, is important for locomotion. But getting down to the how and why we see this relationship will be more complicated. It could be seeing we're 
it could be that we're seeing rapid adaptation for longer limbs to enable dispersal in the introduced range, or it could be a plastic effect where something about the environment of the introduced range developmentally encourages those longer limbs and adult sizes. It could be drift from a bottleneck of introduction where the introduced ones just happen to be sourced from longer long legged stock. But either way, this is not a pattern we're seeing in the farms, which is particularly interesting when we talk about the interplay between those two. So what's next for this project? I definitely want to break down differences by region, compare, say, China to Brazil. I want to look at the shape variation within those measurements. Mass differences, because the farmed ones are huge. Um, so John Urquhart is going to wrap this up for us. Uh, the evalu uh, evaluation of uh, eDNA for monitoring cryptic species, in particular, everyone's favorite, uh, the coarse frog. I'm not John Urquhart, I am Chris Dennison. So yes, John's the first on there, but so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Dennison, and, and on behalf of my colleagues, I am excited to provide a brief introduction into our ongoing research on the potential use of environmental DNA for monitoring of the threatened Western chorus frog. To begin, imagine you are a volunteer contributing your time to an amphibian monitoring initiative in Southern Ontario. You have just arrived at your first field survey site on a warm April morning, and you are greeted by a symphony of chorus frogs. After an acoustic survey, you record the relevant environmental variables, the inurin species you heard, and the appropriate call code for each species based on calling intensity. In the end, you confidently confirm the presence of Western chorus frog at this marsh and provide a rough measure of abundance with your assigned calling code. But this was a sunny morning in April in peak Western chorus frog breeding season. What if we visit this site a week later on a chilly morning with rain showers? Now we can't hear a single inurin calling. And what if we return to this site a month later on a muggy afternoon in mid-May? Now all you hear upon arrival is the peep of a startled green frog. It is here that we uncover some of the most important limitations associated with traditional inurin survey methods including the inconsistency of inurin calling patterns during their respective breeding season due to unpredictable environmental variables, and also the fact that detection of many inurin species, including the cryptic Western chorus frog, is limited by the shortness of its active calling season. One potential solution to these problems is sampling for environmental DNA, or eDNA, which is simply genetic material derived from sources left in the environment by living organisms. Using eDNA sampling and analysis, we can potentially detect target species during periods of low activity or when they are otherwise difficult or impossible to detect using traditional methods. But first and foremost, we must determine the efficacy of this method in actually detecting our species of interest across its stages of development. In our case, that species is the Western chorus frog, specifically the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Canadian Shield population. This population of Western chorus frog is currently listed as threatened under the Species at Risk Act due to ongoing loss or degradation of aquatic breeding habitat caused by development and warming spring temperatures. To investigate whether we can detect Western chorus frog in the field using eDNA, we collected water samples from 16 sites in which chorus frogs were confirmed present and two sites in which chorus frogs were confirmed absent, which served as our controls. To illustrate our study and sampling design, I will use an example from one of our sites, the Bullfrog Bay Road site, that's appropriate. <laughs> After conducting an initial survey for breeding inurins, we collected six water samples, four samples from suitable habitat or close to calling adults in each cardinal direction, one from a centrally, lo uh, cent centrally located location, and one sample where chorus frog chorusing was most intense. Each of these water samples were filtered on site using Sterifex GP pressure filter units, which were then free stored using established protocols. Now, Western chorus frog breeding ended within four to six weeks following our original sampling event. Once calling ceased, we resumed sampling using the aforementioned procedure in one to two week intervals for as long as water was available in order to determine whether we are able to detect Western chorus frog outside of the active breeding season during its larval development and for how long. In the absence of calling, we used DIPNET survey to confirm the presence of our target species and other amphibians and to provide a relative measure of abundance using catch per unit effort. Catch per unit effort for Western chorus frog 
varied widely across each of our sampling sites, with catches per unit effort as low as 0.05 catches per effort, but to as high as 6.7 catches per effort. In addition to answering that foundational question of whether we can detect Western chorus frog in the field using eDNA, we will use our samples to investigate the prevalence of false negative samples, the effect of environmental variables on detectability using eDNA, and the relationship between temporal factors and eDNA detection rates. Improved monitoring and assessment efforts related to the Western chorus frog must consider this amphibian across its unique stages of development, and eDNA may allow us to do just this. So on behalf of my collaborators, I would like to express our gratitude to our funders at the Canadian Wildlife Service and to you for allowing us to share this introduction to our study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, that's great. So, um, Christopher, there's just a, a question right away off the bat. Um, how did you get to the center of the wetland you were sampling? So I, using protocols uh, listed by Envi uh, Blazing Star Environmental, uh, we went, we took our samples around the periphery first and using waders that had been sanitized using eDNA protocols, we went to the center sample and collected that sample from there. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Daphne has, a, has her hand up. Do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, hi, uh, great presentation. I was wondering, do you aim to only detect or do you aim to evaluate the number of individuals in the in the, in the area? So for this initial study, that's a great question. Um, like to use the term that one of my supervisors, Dennis Murray, has used is the low hanging fruit, which is to first, as you said, uh, determine whether we can actually detect Western chorus frog efficiently and effectively using eDNA filter cartridges. And as part of my uh, the second part of my master's will actually involve hopefully some mesocosm, maybe some field experiments to start seeing whether eDNA can be used to create measures of abundance and um, things like um, occupancy models and things like that. But for now, yes, we are just using it to see if we can detect them and for how long and across their stages of development. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Hollis, do you want to do you want to um, let us know the last couple things you were planning on doing? Oh yeah, totally. Um, and then we have a couple of questions for you as well. I I could just say the ne the next item on our list is definitely genomics. Um, I have over uh, one thousand eight hundred tissue samples from all over the world. Adding to that set, uh, ones from Europe, more sites in South America, Hawaii, and the Caribbean. Uh, the pandemic's put a bit of a wrench in our sequencing efforts because most of it's based in China, but they're still going ahead. Oh, that sounds like an amazing study. I don't wonder you're enamored with your, your system. I mean, it sounds it sounds like an ecological nightmare, but it sounds like a very cool study. It's very cool, but yes, horrifying. <laughs> yeah, those really great talks, everybody. Um, so Alexander, there was a couple questions that you've already addressed, but was there anything else you wanted to say about how these peptides might affect freeze tolerance or how quickly AMPs can evolve? Yeah, certainly. I just typed out some quick responses in the chat, but yeah, the current uh, speculation, we don't really have too much to confirm it at the moment, is that you know the microbiome present on the frog skin might be supportive to freezing in some of these species that overwinter by freezing, and that the AMPs expressed by the species might be able to kind of select for these microbes that actually support freezing, like ice nucleating bacteria, or otherwise they just, you know, play a role in, you know, the sudden ramp up of immune defenses in the spring leading into breeding coming out of freezing. Um, and then in terms of the speed that they evolve, um, I'm not sure if there have been any really thorough studies at present, but uh, it does seem to be very quick, like within an individual species, we'll not only see multiple AMP families, but often multiple representatives from each family, which vary by just a couple of amino acids each. So it does seem like even within individual populations, there might be quite a bit of variation that could uh, relate to different selective pressures. Okay, thank you. Um, Hollis, Thanks. another one for you. Um, Scott asked, during your time dealing with farm frogs, did you notice any high rates of potential disease? 
I can only imagine the potential for disease transmission from escaped animals to native amphibians. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty big concern of mine personally. We're working on a small project about that. Um, when I was doing the field sampling in China, we also interviewed the frog farmers, I think on seven or eight different farms, and we asked them, what's your main source of mortality in the farms? And universally, they said disease, and they, in fact, would name a couple different diseases that they had. Some we recognized, uh, chytrid, ronavirus, some we did not. And the effluent from these farms goes straight into local water sources. The effluent often also contains bullfrogs. Um, and while I was there in 2019, Fujian province on the eastern coast of China had some really severe rainstorms that actually flooded many of the frog farms there. And so I'm getting videos coming in on uh, WeChat of frog farms flooded and all the fro frogs just wash into the river. Just horrifying. Um, That's terrible. Additionally, there's international trade in these live frogs. Um, Ontario, I think, has rules against it, but the U.S. imports millions of live bullfrogs every year from Chinese farms. No, oh, that is, um, yeah, your story is very interesting, but yeah, terrifying. <laughs> um, Tom, Tom, you have a question. Yeah, great talks from everyone in this session. I uh, really enjoyed them. Uh, my talks for, for Hollis as well. Um, you mentioned differences by region and you know there's a number of things that could be at play here um you know time since since the that they occurred in in the native in the in that landscape um the diversity of competitors the size of available prey i'm just wondering if you have any sort of a priori predictions uh and, and what some of those predictions might be time since introduction is a big one uh it's difficult to nail down a, a history of the population in a particular site because we may have information about when they first entered the region but we don't know at this particular lake have they been here for 100 years um, the oldest ones being uh, the western us like california even up into bc are some of the oldest theoretical populations and the youngest would be uh, in south america so obviously, if, if we're hypothesizing selection, um, that would be a more severe effect the longer they've been in their introduced area. Um, outside of that, there's just so many other uh, ecological influences that could be at play here. It's hard to pick just one. Excellent, thank you. Um, so Christopher, I believe this one was from you, for you, uh, Barb asked if you're finding a lot of inhibitors in your samples, uh, the pond water is looking pretty murky. Yeah, um, so that was, a, I just answered it in the text too, so good timing, but yes, we did find, especially later in the season, that our ability to filter water through the filters became more difficult uh, given the increase in sediments and uh, vegetation in the water as the season went forward. And there's certainly a significant difference between each site in terms of the clearness of the water. So there were, in some cases, we were only able to get 30 mils into the filter before it clogged and you were really unable to get any more through. Whereas at other clear sites, you were able to get up to 800. So Obviously, recording those volumes is critical and to when we're doing the analysis to be able to correct it back to um, our EPA hits. All right, and Hollis, another question for you. Um, Gabrielle asked, when dealing with farm frogs, I would think that there would be a lot of inbreeding considering the amount of space that they have to move in. But in the video, I was seeing a lot of color morphs, which means there is higher levels of genetic diversity or mutation than expected. Do you know if there was indeed a lot of inbreeding? And if so, you see a higher rate of phenotypic mutations when there is a lot, when taking morphological data. And by phenotypic mutations, I mean missing, adding limbs and color differences. Um, so the, we did see a lot of unusual color morphs in the farms, but not in a way that suggests to me they're more diverse. We would see um like 
maybe two or three different color morphs in all the different farms as if they had happened once and spread to all the different farms because they exchange uh, tadpoles. I would expect a lot of bottlenecking in these farm scenarios, um, not just because uh, they don't have a lot of room to move around, but because the farmers may only breed a small subset of their adult frogs. Um, there's one particular farm in Idaho that uh, I was very dismayed to learn uses a single pairing to seed each generation. So huge reduction in diversity. Uh, and occasionally he would source more individuals from outside the farm. Um, but in a situation like that, it's hard to imagine how these color morphs appear, and yet they do. Um, in that farm where they're kind of bottlenecking every generation, we see differences in the colors in adults. Um, it could be a developmental influence. Um, some of them will come out with yellow spots or like rosettes. And I'd be very interested to dig into the mechanisms of that. At this time, I don't know. But uh, you definitely may have noticed in the video, um, there'll be some pitch blacks, black bullfrogs that appear in the, in the farms in China, and also some like cyan blue ones, similar to the blue frogs you can find in some places in, in Ontario.